Let's get into the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel according to Luke, Luke chapter 22, as we continue in our Sabbath series. How many were blessed by Pastor Ivar's message last week? Amen? Absolutely. As he walked us through the, the Bible, seeing all the many different applications of the Sabbath and finding its, uh, its, its real end point and, and end point, beginning, center, all of it, really the main focus being Jesus. Jesus is the Sabbath. Come unto me, all of you who are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you what? I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is what? Light, right? Jesus is the Sabbath. And so uh, it's that backdrop that we are able to move to this next phase of our Sabbath series. So in Luke chapter 22, verse 14, you'll see it on the screen as well. This Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. And it says, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant, the new covenant, the new agreement, the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the invitation to be in your presence in this very space and time, this very special holiday, this holy day that we get to celebrate every single week. And Father, we look forward to what you have to share with us as we open our hearts to you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen. So Jesus says to them that this is, this is the new covenant. This is the new covenant. And I've always been a bit uh, concerned about how this text is interpreted. Because what does it mean that it's a new covenant? Where do we even get that language from? In fact, it doesn't even originate with Jesus in his words, and it, although it continues on even with Paul in the book of Hebrews. But let's look at Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31 is the first time that we hear this language of a new covenant, a new agreement. And you know how covenants work, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's almost contractual. God entered into a covenant, a relationship with his people, and, and there were things that they had to do to meet their end of the covenant, and there were things that God had to do to meet his end of the covenant. What happened often in the Old Testament is that God's people did not meet their end of the covenant, and because of that, the covenant was broken. And many times the, the, the community fell uh, in, in dire situations because of their breaking of God's commandments and so on and so forth. And so the Bible says in chapter 31 of Jeremiah, verse 31, the days are what? Coming, declares the Lord. They're not here right now. They are coming when I will make a what? New covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. Now this is important at the time. Remember... Judah, Judah is a tribe, right? It's the tribe of Judah, also included would be the tribe of Benjamin. This is where you get the, the term Jews from. Jews are from the tribe of Judah. But God also says Israel, because Judah and Benjamin broke off, and the Jews were in Jerusalem, and the rest of Israel, the other ten tribes, they made up another group. Some of them were considered Samaritans, right? So there was tribalism even among the people of God. Can you believe that? That would never happen today. You have to understand something here. We get caught up with denominations. We get caught up even with ad in Adventism, certain churches that do things a different way. God is never confused. He always, knows who, he always knows who his people are. That's why he told his disciples, I have sheep in other pens, sheep in other folds. God's remnant will always include those 
who are following after Jesus, regardless of what denomination they were raised in or what they were a part of and where their official membership is. So a remnant people will never be a denomination. It will be a people who are following Jesus. Amen? And sealed by his Holy Spirit. And of course, we have identifying markers of what that remnant group looks like. And one of them is that they keep the commandments of God. And we'll talk about that today. So he says, I make a new covenant with Judah and with, and, and with Israel. And it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand. This is the difference. It won't be like the other covenant. And we always think, well, does that mean there's going to be different rules, different commandments, a different set of expectations? Well, he tells us why it's not like the old covenant. He says, it will not be like the old covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. What do parents do when they have little ones and they're about to cross the street? What do parents do? They grab a hold of their hand, right? They just want to make sure they stay close and that there's no temptation to run off. You're holding my hand because we're crossing the street and it's dangerous. Hold my hand. And this is, a, this is imagery that is similar to an a parent taking their young ones by the hand and leading them because that's where Israel was at the time, coming out of Egypt. He says, because they broke my what? Covenant, though I was a husband to them. He said, I had to take them by the hand because they were disobedient. I had to grab them by the hand and lead them because they would not listen. They would break my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their where? In their minds, and I will write it where? In their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people, and no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all what? Know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. Wow, this sounds like a pretty dynamic covenant that God is making with the people. Now, you know in the first covenant, it was written in stone, and also it was written on paper, right? They had scrolls to remind them of the covenant that they had with God. He says, no, but the day is coming when a new covenant will be written in their hearts, in their minds. That makes it more personal. It makes it actually more intimate. Here's the reality. Most of us, when we think about the law and we think about the Sabbath and the requirements of it, when we were raised in this church and raised in this culture, we would often tell people, you need to keep the commandments of God because this is what the last day people will look like when they're standing firm for the Lord. They will be commandment keepers, right? We've, we've been taught this. And we've heard these verses, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, let's go to this text real quick here. Let's go to this text. It's in, it's in John chapter 14, verse 15. Now, the NIV and the King James translate it pretty much the same, and a lot of translations will translate it this way, but it's not an accurate translation. The verse reads this way in the NIV. If you love me, do what? Keep my commands. If you love me, keep my commands. King James reads it, translates it the same way. What does this express? If you love me, keep my my commands. How does that read? Do what I tell you? It, it, it's actually a command itself, is it not? It's a commandment itself. If you love me, keep my commands. This message was given in the upper room. This message is when Jesus with, was with his disciples before his arrest. And so this final message with his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. So chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, and chapter 17 of John are such just intimate and passionate words that are recorded from Jesus to his disciples. These are the final words before they see their master tortured and killed. And so Christ is wanting to make sure they really have it all crystallized in their mind what is most important. So he says, if you love me, keep my commands. And I can't tell you how many times I have heard this verse, read this verse, heard it taught and preached as a commandment for us to prove to God that we what? That we love him. Doesn't matter what you think. Doesn't matter what your opinion is. If you love God, you're going to do what he says. All right, I'll do it. So, Lord, if you tell me to keep the Sabbath, I'm going to keep it. 
This is what we do when we're, when we're, a lot of times when we're evangelizing. We tell them, you guys think you've been loving God, but you, you, you haven't known all the truth. So this is what you must do. And so we have learned that commandment keeping is a way of showing God that he's loved. Now, this you have to understand. God has never commanded love. If you command love and demand love, it's not going to be love. Try that in your marriage, anybody. Try that in your marriage. <laughs> Honey, you better love me. And if you love me, you're going to do what I say. How does that work? Yeah, good luck. Right? It doesn't work that way. But most of us are comfortable with that expression in relation to God because he's God. He's master. He's ruler. He has all the power. He has the right to command you to do what he says and prove to him that you love him. But that's not the way it reads in the Greek. In the Greek, in the Greek, it is actually the future tense of the verb. Terestete. It says, you will keep my commands. If you love me, you will keep my commands. Now, how does that read? Is it a command? It's not a command. It's prophetic. God is saying, if you love me, this is what will naturally happen from being in a loving relationship with me. If you continue to read on in that chapter, you'll see it expressed again. Let's go down to verse 23. Verse 23 and verse 24 says, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will what? Obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. We will abide with them. you got to hold on to that word because we're going to come back to it. Anyone who does not love me will what? The only basis in which God wants our obedience to come from is from where? Love. That's why he says, if you love me. Now, let me ask you this question. Can you love someone you don't know? Can you love someone you don't know? Absolutely not. This is why John tells us in his first email, 1 John chapter 3, he says in verse 6, he says, he says, anyone who continues to live in sin, you know, uh, living as a, as a lawbreaker, right? You know, uh, he says anyone who continues to live in sin is someone who proves that they have never known God and they've never seen him. This is so important because I'm going to share something with you that most of you can relate with and connect with, but I want you to see how this works. The reason why God wants it to be written in our hearts is it's, it's a way of expressing he wants it to be authentic and real. He doesn't want any of this fake stuff. This is why in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, those who say, Lord, Lord, did we not, did we not, did we not prophesy in your name? These are prophets. Did we not cast out demons in your name? You know it takes faith to cast out demons, right? Did we not perform many miracles in your name? Yes, it takes faith to perform miracles. Christ says, yes, you did, but I never knew you. And the implication is because he didn't know them, they also didn't know him. They knew of his power and they wanted that. They knew of his instructions because they followed it. But how do you know it didn't come from a place of love? Because their argument isn't, Lord, wait, wait, wait a second. You, you, you didn't love us enough to take us into your kingdom? Your grace wasn't sufficient enough? Your mercy did not abound. What, what their argument was what? Works. Did we not? Were we not the ones that led our children to Gillette for Pathfinder Campery? <laughs> Sorry, Alex. Sorry, Alex. I'm not calling you out. You are right. You're a righteous man. That's a good man. Did we not? And many of us would have this argument if Jesus says, Guys, yeah, it's not going to work out. What? Do you know how many Sabbaths I went to church when I didn't want to? And I did it just for you, Lord, to prove to you that I love you. 
And it doesn't work that way in relationships. Because I want you to see how it, how, it, how it sounds. Talk to your spouse and say, ooh, I have a new coworker. Ooh. But honey, don't worry. I'm not going to do anything because I love you. Doesn't that sound romantic? I think that's romantic. Ooh, I want to, but I won't because I'm faithful to our covenant. Anybody like that? I think that sounds like faithfulness, right? Ladies, what's wrong with that? <laughs> Fellas, what's wrong with that? Why do you feel uncomfortable with that? Somebody's saying, oh, I'm telling you I would leave this marriage right now, but... I made a covenant with God, and because I love him, I'll stick with you. But that's obedience, right? What's missing in this scenario? What you would hope from your partner is, is because of their fidelity, because of their attraction to you, because they're enamored with you, be, I know this sounds you know, unrealistic, but because they love you so much, they don't even have eyes for anyone else. And I know how it goes, ladies. You'll be walking Disneyland, and you'll, see, you'll spot someone before he does, and you look at him like, I wish you would look. <laughs> right? You're trying to gauge just how faithful, even with his eyes, as Job says, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Right? If law has to keep you together, it doesn't feel like love. Amen? And this is the problem because I'll be honest with you. There is not one time ever since we have had Nathan in our love and care that I have ever said, I guess I'll feed him. I don't want to go to jail. But you know there's laws in place to prevent us from being that negligent, right? Right? There are laws in place, but how many parents actually need those laws to care for their children? Because what motivates them to care for their children? Is it law? It's what? It's love. Law is only necessary because of sin. That's what Paul says. It's added because some people are so depraved that love is not a motivation. They're so broken they're so damaged that law has to step in and say, if you don't feed your children and clothe them and clean them, we will take them away from you. But most of us in this room have never even read those laws because love has governed you. Amen? God is wanting us to come to the same place. If he has to hold you by the hand and say, come on, come on, nope, right now, let's go, that doesn't feel like the relationship that God desires. That's why when we go to John 15, Jesus amps it up a little bit more. In John 15, he, he says these words, remain in me, verses 4 and 5, remain in me as I also remain where? In you, abide in me. What he's saying is I'm wanting to make my home with you. I want us to make a home together. Abide in me. Abide in me. Rest in me. As I also remain in you, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. God clearly wants us to be fruitful. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Now, now, most will say bear fruit. Well, that's because God is wanting us to minister. He wants us to stay close to him and read his, read his word, follow his commandments. That way we, we'll do what he says and we'll tell people about Jesus. You're missing the point. Christ came to evangelize, not simply so you can just follow instructions. He's wanting you to do this with a purpose. What is the purpose? Verse 9 of that same chapter, verse 9, it says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. You guys didn't even catch that. As the Father has loved me, his only begotten Son, the same intensity, the same passion, the same depth, the same love that the Father has for me, I have for you. 
When you realize that God loves you that much, do you know how almost impossible it is to be lost? You have to want to be lost. You have to pray to be lost. You have to be one of those people that when you see Christ come again, you are begging for rocks to fall on you. That's how difficult it is. Because the Father so loves you. But pastor, but God wants me to love him. No, 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 no. He prophesied that you would love him. He believes that if you allow him to pour his love into you and shower you with his affection, if he were to give you all that, he believes that something transformative would happen in your heart and that you would naturally be aligned with him. If you remain in me, if I remain in you, if all of these things happen, so he says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. He says, if, so he says, now remain in my love, remain in my love. Well, Lord, how do we remain in your love? If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Wait a second, are you telling me I have to keep your commandments in order for you to love me? No, 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 you missed the point. I'm saying remain in my love. How you remain in my love is you keep my instructions. Well, that sounds legalistic. No, 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 no. Because when I tell Nathan to look both ways before he crosses the street, am I being manipulative? Am I being arbitrary? Or am I being loving? If Nathan chooses not to follow my instructions, he's stepping outside of the loving instructions that I gave him in order to do what? To protect him. I give my instructions with a purpose. So when God gives us his instructions, it is always his way to love on us. Let me give you another point. Nathan, brush your teeth. Is that loving or is that being a meanie? Well, I want to keep that vanilla ice cream taste in my mouth as I go to sleep. <laughs> Dad, you're mean. Am I being mean or am I being loving? At this stage, he doesn't quite understand the importance of flossing and brushing his teeth. But one day, family, he going to know it's important. <laughs> and daddy won't have to tell him, son, did you brush your teeth? He'll be 27 years old, and I guarantee he will never have a text from me saying, son, did you floss? Because hopefully by that time, it's been written where? It's been written here in his heart because that signifies he understands it. He gets it. He has tasted and he has seen that the Lord is good. The Bible tells us that we love because he first loved us. There is something about God loving on us that transforms our heart. It's contagious in a good way. You keep my father's commands, I, as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. Let me just say this real quick. Christ says he kept his father's commands. Did he really keep his father's commands? This is a little bit of a trick question. Did he really keep his father's commands? Or was Jesus just being himself? Did he really have to say, oh, dad, if you want me to today, I guess. Because remember, as the Father has loved him, he loves us. So he's already bought into it. For God so loved the world. That's not just the Father, that's the Son and the Holy Spirit. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Christ signs off on it because he loves us as much as the Father loves us. He, they're in love with us, right? Jesus never had to say, oh, I guess, Dad. He already loved Judas. He already loved Peter. He gave of himself. Yes, it looks like on the outside he's keeping the commandments of God. But it's not the master-servant dynamic that we think. How do I know? John 15, 15. What does John 15, 15 say? We don't have it in the text. John 15, 15 says, I no longer call you servants, for servants do not know the master's business. I have called you what? Friends, for I've told you everything my father has made known to me. No more master-servant dynamic. We are here. We are friends. We're buddies. We love each other. This is the relationship God has always desired to have with us, where we're made in his likeness and we can look at him. He, so he says, he says, I have told you all this. I have told you all this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be what? Complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. The commandments of God have always been an expression of love. The Sabbath day is no different. 
The Sabbath is an expression of God loving on you. It is God adoring you on the birthday, celebrating your birth. It is God also making sure it is a command that no one can overburden you, that you get this day of rest. It is God in every way doing this, and it's also a day where we get to abide in God. Because let's keep it honest. You know a full day's work it's rough sometimes to pray. It's rough to, to get into those devotionals. It's rough to have that connection. All you need is a bath and to hit your pillow and you're done for the day. And God says, but on this day, let's go out on a date. <laughs> on this day, abide in me, even more so because you have no more distractions. Abide in me. That's what the word really communicates. It's the safety and trust of being close to God, and that is what the Sabbath is as well. I'm going to say something to you, and I'm going to wrap it up here. If you think of the Sabbath as law, you're missing the point. If the only way you can communicate the Sabbath is through law, you're missing the point in the same way if you think you only feed your children because of the laws of the county, you're missing the point. If you're thinking of the Sabbath as law instead of love, you're missing the point. At this stage in my life, I do not keep the seventh-day Sabbath holy because I'm commanded to do so. It is so written and ingrained in my heart that even if God were to say, you don't even have to, I'd be like, I'm still going to do it. I love it too much, and I love you too much. I know the meaning behind it. How could I not do it? Even when we come together in communion, you know it's a command? Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. How many of you take communion thinking it's a command? How many of you take communion thinking if you don't do it, you won't be saved? It's a command of Jesus, do this in remembrance of me. If you think of it as a command, you're missing the point. We enter into this communion experience because we love God. And if you don't love him right now, it's okay. You just need to get to know him better. You don't need to fake it. Don't pretend. Be real. Listen to what Paul says, and we close on this. Listen to what Paul says here. Paul says that verse, chapter 1 of Philippians, chapter 1 of uh, of Philippians, verses 4 through 6, and all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Let me pause it for a second. Enjoy, right? Christ says, I give you all these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Everything that God gives us is always for our joy to be complete. As simplistic as this sound, the Sabbath, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder, all of it is so that we can be happy. Can I be honest with you? So you can be happy. That you can have joy that's just overflowing. So Christ says, so Christ says this through his servant Paul. He says, now being, he's being confident of this that he who began a good work in you will do what? Carry it. Carry it on to win. To completion until the day day of Christ Jesus. Sabbath gives us an opportunity to pause and to remember that we are a part of something. We are a part of Christ. That we get to abide in him. And we get to experience the fruitfulness of of, of that marriage, of that relationship. If the relationship between you and God is law and not love, you have missed it. Law is only necessary when you're a knucklehead. Law is necessary when you're stubborn and you're a child and you need to be guided by someone holding your hand. But when you are mature and you look upon Christ with that unveiled face, as Paul says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we become transformed by it. If you have not come to the point where you love God, it's because you really haven't received his love. You haven't accepted it. You haven't come to know him the way that Paul came to know him, the way that Jesus knew him, the way I want you to know him. We're going to take part in this communion experience, taking the symbolic body of Christ and the symbolic blood of Christ in this experience is a way of communicating our desire to abide in Jesus and for him to abide in us. Make your home in my heart. God says a new covenant is that I am going to love you to completion. I'm going to love on you so much that you're going to change. You're going to experience my joy in a way 
that you will feel happiness and a peace that passes all understanding. Church family, do you want that? If you want that, raise your hand where you are. If you want that, raise your hand where you are. Father God, you see those who are raising their hand. We desire this deep, abiding connection with you. We don't want it to be law that forces us to do these things because we're beyond that. We're not children. We know you better. So Father, we want it to be love. You prophesied that it would be love. You prophesied that if we loved you, this is what would happen. So, Father, as we prepare our hearts to be served by our leaders and we prepare our hearts and our minds to take part in this, may we be able to intimately focus on the abiding presence of Jesus on this special Sabbath day. And may it be a springboard for Sabbaths to come, that when we come to this day, that we're reminded of your desire to abide in us. Make your home in our hearts the new covenant in Jesus' name. Amen.